Oh. Uh, I'm getting ready to do my program and a pepper flower just fell into my coffee. And uh, oddly enough, it's from the Jalokia, the really super hot pepper. This ought to be interesting. I'm not going to die. Well then, let's get on with the show. <laughs> Welcome to the Voodoo Garden, everybody. My name is Ray. I will be your host. Weekend Edition. Yes, we have a Weekend Edition. And, and, as soon as I'm done, I'm going to haul the camera in. Um, by the way, I'm out here in the hall because I can't fit in the downstairs Voodoo Garden. Everything got a little bit too big, and so it looked kind of corny. I started to film, and I was kind of being pushed away and pushed to the side, and everything looked stupid. And, uh, I just figured, well, I'll just bring out a couple plants, and we'll have it out here. How's that sound? Anyway, uh, as soon as I'm done, I'm going to take you inside inside to the Voodoo Garden, and I'm going to show you the banana plant, or I'll drag it out here. I think that's better. I think I'm going to drag the banana tree out here and show you. By the way, the banana tree, when I got it, when I got the banana tree, it was like this little tiny foot tall slip, and it had like two little broken leaves. It looked really sad, and uh, it was wrapped up in newspaper. It had a little tiny soil ball, and I planted it. I just want to tell you that, okay? I want to tell you that because I want to get you all set up to what I'm going to drag out of that room today. But, but first, I want to answer your gardening questions because you posted some really good ones and these ones were good. These ones were really, really good. And it's not a matter of playing Stump Ray and see if you can find a question that he can't answer. It's a matter of these are your questions and these are your concerns. These are real live people that have real life problems or issues with their plants and they're asking me for advice. So I'm going to dig into my empty head here and I'm going to give you the best possible advice I possibly can here. How's that sound? Okay, first one is from Charity. Charity says, do you know how to keep cats from peeing in your plants? Did I tell you this is going to be a good one? Um, I've gotten that question so many times and I used to have cats. Yeah, I did. I, I used to have cats when I lived in Seattle, and uh, my biggest problem was my cat, Groucho. I had a little cat named Groucho. Groucho would pee in my plant. I had a plant in my bedroom, and Groucho would find her way into the bedroom, dig a hole, pee or poop, and then bury it. So I didn't even know this was going on. And uh, one day, I noticed that there was a little pile of dirt in there, and I went to smooth it out, and my fingers rubbed a doo-doo. Yeah, that's how I found out. And that plant was full of crap. So that's how I found out. She was very good at hiding the evidence. But um, as far as keeping your cats out of your plants, now I'm assuming these are indoor plants, right, Charity? Um, I'm thinking, well, outdoor plants, it's kind of hard because you have a big garden and it's really a hard area to uh, uh, keep them away. Some people say certain kinds of plants. Some people say put up something shiny, something loud. I've never seen anything outside that can keep a cat out of your garden. But indoors, it's a little bit different. Cats like a a dirt surface or a sand surface, something to dig into. They don't normally go to the bathroom like on your lawn. They'll find a dirt area to go to the bathroom. So I thought, hmm, okay. This is how I would do it for my indoor plants if I wanted to keep a cat out of it. They have bags at uh, your local um, uh, greenhouse or a big box store and uh, they je or craft stores like Michael's Crafts. Uh, you can get bags of sphagnum moss and it's not the the stuff that you get in the bales that gross crap that you grow in no this is the fluffy stuff that they use for arts and crafts and you can take the fluffy stuff and lay it on top of your soil in your pots now this will also help keep the moisture down and it's very good by the way if you put a nice coating on it's very good at keeping fungus gnats out of your plants because those fungus gnats they like to land on the soil lay their eggs but they don't like to go through anything like sand or anything like that a nice firm pack of peat moss. Kind of fluff it up at the top, but pack it down around the soil. That's gonna help keep your fungus nets out, but the cats don't like that because they don't like, they like to dig a hole and they can't dig a hole in that. So they like to do that. And also, if you can get some chopsticks, I know this sounds silly, but you know what? Sometimes gardening can be a little bit silly. Get yourself some chopsticks and put a bunch of those in your plants because the cat isn't going to be able to get comfortable, isn't going to be able to get between these chopsticks, and it's going to help keep the cat out of there. Make it uncomfortable for the cat. That's basically what I do. I, I don't want to use any chemicals. They have some stuff that you can spray. It's called Kitty No. And uh, the thing is, is that that puts a, a, some weird scent in the air that makes your cat a nervous wreck. I've tried this and it made my cat a nervous wreck. I don't want to do that to my pet. 
So um, this is my suggestion. Uh, the light, fluffy peat moss, toss it on top of your plants or, uh, uh, and or some chopsticks to put in there. And that'll hold the moss in place. And it actually doesn't look quite so bad on your plants. That's my advice for keeping cats out of your plants. I hope it works for you. Next one comes from Andrea. Hold on, Andrea. Ray's addicted to coffee. Andrea asks, how do you improve the soil of a plant that's so big that can't be transplanted? Ooh. It's filling its pot so much with roots that it's very hard to remove old soil and replace it with new. That's a good question as well. I had a plant like that, and uh, that was my Christmas cactus. I had that plant in that pot for, I don't know, eight years, something like that, almost a decade. And I also had another one called uh, Split Leaf Philodendron, uh, also known as Monstera. That plant was so huge, there was no way on earth that's coming out of that pot, and it was full of roots. And you can, you know, once it uses up all the dirt, what are you going to do? And uh, transplanting it, you don't want to have to transplant it because it's so big, and you don't have a pot that's big enough. That was one of the problems that Andrea had. What I would do is this. you you got to just maintain your plant. You can't really do anything for it except keep it well fed. As long as it's happy and healthy in its pot, all you, all you have to do is keep it well fed. And that doesn't mean adding fertilizers and stuff because you don't want to really screw with the, the roots and, and the, the soil pH and all that other nonsense. What I would do is this. I would get a bag of bagged compost because I don't recommend bringing in compost from outside. Get a, a bag of compost or composted chicken manure at your local store, whatever store sells it, usually Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, any place, even order it online. You can order it online. Take that, take about, I'd say a small handful per gallon of water, mix it up, let it set overnight, and use this to water your plant every single time. What this is going to do is it's going to feed your plants mildly and it's also going to get all of the good stuff out of the compost, feed the soil, feed the roots, feed the microbes that are still in there. And there are a lot of microbes. If your plant has been in there that long, it has a whole lot of healthy, good stuff going on in the soil. It just doesn't have a lot of soil. So you want to feed what's in there the best that you possibly can. And uh, you could use artificial fertilizers, but there is a, it's like a dead end road. And I've gone on about that so long, I don't want to go on it anymore. I would, if it was my plant, I would just feed it keep it pruned, and keep it well shaped. You don't want it to get over tall, otherwise it's gonna put a lot of stress on those tangled up roots. Feed it well with a compost tea. That is something that I would do. I highly recommend that. That's gonna keep your plant healthy. So, simple answer, huh? Okay, next one, Frankie. Frankie with an I. Um, Frankie says, see I just slipped that in there. <laughs> Frankie says, I live in an apartment and I don't get very good lighting during the winter months. I was wondering if you could suggest good indoor lighting that isn't going to break the bank with my electric bill. Do you pay a lot for electricity with all the lights in your, in your grow room? Um, I've been asked that a lot and uh, one of the, that goes on with another question somebody asked me on Facebook today. They said, do you have uh, lists of stuff that you've planted and keep track of that? And I answered that like I'm going to answer this. I keep no lists. I keep no records. I don't do that kind of stuff. A lot of people will plan their garden and write down stuff. I never focus too much on that. I kind of wing it. You know, I, everything I do, I just, I don't know, I just do it and I don't overthink it because I think that seems to work out well for me. If I overthink something, it tends to go wrong with me. Now, as far as lighting, I use those uh, compact fluorescents. They're 85 watt usage and they are the incandescent equivalent. Oh, I get it. I get beat up every time I mention this, but I've mentioned it anyway. It's the incandescent equivalent of 300 watt. And I'm going to put the link um, below this video in the video description to the bulbs that I use. Those are the most economical bulbs for use and the best lighting, the best Kelvin, all of that stuff that none of us really need to think about. It's basically the best bulb I've ever had for growing, flowering, every stage of your, your plant. Not too bright, not too dim. Uh, the price is right. And uh, I've used a lot of bulbs. So this is what I recommend. Other people may have other ideas, but the, you're asking me for my ideas. I'm going to put a link to those bulbs. And I use those exclusively in my growing. It works like a charm. As far as electric, it's kind of hard to gauge how much electric I use because all the bulbs I use, I use more bulbs than most of you put together. <laughs> I do. But I do this because I demonstrate a lot of growing techniques and I have two grow rooms. So most of you don't 
go full tilt like I do, but you can do it on a smaller scale. My lighting generates minimal heat, but that excess heat helps keep the rooms warm, so I don't have to pay to keep the rooms warm, so it helps out that way. And um, uh, so I don't really know how much I use for electricity. I'm saying one bulb, if you put one bulb of the ones that I put on the lake, you're going to be able to grow something like this Jalokia pepper easily, or you know, maybe about four of these, half a dozen of these, you know, you're going to be able to grow about maybe a three foot by three foot area with one bulb, unless you have super light intensive plants. You know, there's nothing exactly definite in this, but use these bulbs, space them approximately, I'd say two to three feet apart and you're gonna have optimum growing conditions for just about anything you're gonna be growing indoors. And it's not gonna break the bank. The electricity for those is, like say one bulb is gonna cost you, I don't know, maybe a few bucks a month, something like that. I run them 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And uh, so you can kind of gauge it by that, but just, I guess you'd have to do a calculation with how much you pay for electricity. So they're not very expensive. And what you get out of it isn't so much the, the return of food. Some people calculate it like, well, I'm using this much for electricity. I should get this much food. Well, I don't grow like that. And if you grow like that, that's fine. But with me, I grow up for enjoyment, you know, and uh, this is my hobby. You know, I don't go out. I don't party. I don't buy expensive things. I spend my money on electricity and bulbs to grow my plants to have a good time. And then I share it with my friends. So it's kind of a balance. Next question, Janice. Janice says, uh, oh, okay. I'm going to do this between every question just for the heck of it. Janice says, uh, I'm growing an avocado tree that I started from a pit. It's about a foot tall. The tip ends of the leaves turn brown. Is it too much water, not enough water, too much or too little light, etc.? I have no idea what's wrong. <laughs> well, the answer is yes. Um, it can be any one of those things. When a, a plant, oh look, I have a prop. When you have a plant, by the way, this is an avocado plant, and this is approximately, I'd say, a little over a foot tall. So this is a very nice example of what you're growing. This is my avocado plant, and right on cue, for some reason, it has a brown tip to a leaf. Yeah, and, um, oh, make sure this doesn't roll down the stairs. Anyway, when uh, you said a brown tip to the leaf, I assumed you didn't mean the edges here. I thought you meant like the tips of the leaves. And that happens occasionally on a plant. And if you have a bunch of leaves like this one does, and you get a couple brown, it's outside my house. Yeah, you better keep driving. Wow. You know, I have my blinds open to get extra light into my house here because I'm filming and these ridiculous lights on the stand aren't bright enough, otherwise I'd be in a shadow. And I got my blinds open and there's a street and this guy in a truck just now drove by, stopped and stared right at me. You butthead. I can't wait to move. <laughs> Nosy freaking neighbors. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> back to our program. Buttheads. Anyway, um, a brown tip to a leaf is no big deal. Uh, and there he is again. Hope you get a flat tire. He's backing up down the road now. I'm going to keep going until somebody rings the doorbell, I guess. Anyway, let's hurry up and get this done. Um, uh, the brown tips of the leaves, not a problem as long as you just have one or two. What normally happens is when a plant is stressed, it'll start showing it. It has no way of telling you vocally, so it shows it in the way of what it does to its leaves. And uh, with this one, I had a pH problem. It was a little off and I was overwatering it. Yes, I actually overwatered a plant. <laughs> Silly me. And a couple of the leaf tips turned brown. So I let it dry out. I tested the pH, threw in some coffee, lowered it down because my soil for some reason keeps going on the alkaline high pH. So I have to dump in coffee or some vinegar water to bring it back down again. So I'm constantly fighting pH problems. But um, there are around six things in this circle of life your plant has. It has soil, it has pot size, it has fertilizer, it has light, it has water, and oh crap, I just forgot the sixth one. But all of these things, look at all the different things that your plant has and check each one. How's your light? Is your light okay? Okay, mark that one off the list. How's your soil? Do you have good soil? Good quality, rich, well-drained soil. If you have that, check that off. Keep going down the line. Something is off in this circle of six that you have going on with your plant. And that's how I usually uh, 
go with my plants. I look at every little thing and I mark them off. And if one thing is right, the next thing must be wrong. And if that's not wrong, I keep going. And then if you go through the whole list and everything is perfectly right, chalk it up to an act of God. You know, sometimes I've had plants that just flat out died. I did everything perfect. I went by the book. I worked every little piece of magic I can and the darn thing just went boom and died. And I thought, you know what? The heck with you. And I threw it in the compost pile. You do what you can, you help what you can, and then you just let nature take its course with the rest. But as long as you only have a couple, don't worry about it. Snip them off. Uh, they'll more than likely not have a problem. As long as the new leaves are fine, you're doing fine. Okay, next one. Um, M. Brands uh, asks, some of us live in town with limited gardening space. What plants do you suggest have a high density food? Let's say the place is limited to seven by three, seven foot by three, and the long side is facing a wall. What would you grow? Ooh, this one I think is probably going to get a lot of answers from the viewers out there because this is an open-ended question. I mean, there is no proper answer for this. There is just opinion. So uh, if I had a seven foot wide by three foot deep area and I, uh, there was a wall against it. Now, first of all, I don't know if this wall is on the north side, south side. That makes all the difference in the world. If your wall is on the north side, you have a really great growing space. If it's on the east or west side, you're going to have some shade. If it's on the south side and your plants are on the north side, <laughs> <laughs> Give it up and go to the grocery store because not much is going to grow there. But uh, let's just say you have a good uh, north wall. You got seven foot by three foot. Tomatoes. Tomatoes give me a lot and you can grow them straight up. I like to grow mine out. You can take them straight up. Take them along the wall. They love the heat. They're going to love the heat and light bounced off the wall. And you want your tallest stuff to the north and your shortest stuff to the south. And you want to plant them east to west. That way the light, like say if you have a row like this going north and south and your sun comes up. When your sun comes up in the morning, it's going to block this side. And then when it's going down in the evening, it's going to block this side. So you're really short changing yourself. If you put it this way, the rows, it doesn't block anything. You see what I mean? So tall stuff to the back, going east and west, tomatoes. Then the next step in line, the shorter plants are going to be peppers. Next thing, because peppers are great. I love peppers. They go with so many things and you can get a lot for a small amount of space. Tomatoes to start, you can can those, freeze those, sauce those, do all kinds of stuff. Peppers, they're a wonderful thing. Next thing in line, I would think if I'm going to go for the most amount of food, um, let's see, beans. Beans, bush beans, wonderful stuff. Bush beans are fantastic, great uh, plant to grow, fast, easy, and you can control them and they're not going to get in the way of anything. And uh, we're pretty much getting to the front. The front, I would go with root crop because uh, root crops tend to have, well, like carrots. I would pack it full of carrots and, uh, because the carrot greens aren't going to get quite as tall. They're going to get maximum amount of sun being in front of everything loaded up with carrots and you don't have to plant carrots a few inches apart. Some people, they say, space them this far. I didn't do that. If you go back on my video, if you go back on my video on the Praxis channel, uh, I have a video where I grew these carrots over a foot long. And uh, all you have to do is make sure you dig that soil deep through the whole bed. Dig it deep because you want to make sure you get maximum root penetration. That's going to give you the best yield no matter what you grow. So dig it deep, make it nice and loose, keep it fertile, keep them well fed. You can grow enough out of a seven foot by three foot area to give you vegetables for many, many months. I mean, almost, I would almost take that as a challenge to grow enough food to get me through the winter. If I, you know, I might be able to do that. You know what? I might just do that one of these times. That actually sounds like fun. Once I move, and I get set up, I'm going to be growing all of my vegetables, every vegetable I possibly use. I'm going to grow that in my garden, but I think I'm going to do that, and uh, I'll try and bring that back up. I'm going to grow a, a four foot by eight foot bed, because that's a standard size, four foot by eight foot bed, and see how much I can pack into one little area and see how much food I can get out of that. Sounds like a great project, doesn't it? This is going to be fun. Okay, anyway, um, yeah. Those things would be the things that I would grow because you get the nutrition, you get the variety, and you get bulk out of all of the things I listed. And in between, you can grow things like radishes, maybe a little lettuce here and there, spinach, and do just fine. Pack it in there, feed it well, dig it deep and loose. Good luck. Last question, Eric. I don't have to yell. I have a microphone. Eric. <laughs> Eric said, oh, I almost forgot. You thought I forgot. Okay. Last question is from Eric. 
Why is my jasmine never flowering? Also, how can I stop this? <laughs> Um, how can you stop it from not flowering is, is what I'm assuming. Okay, well, I do have another prop. This here, Eric, is my jasmine. Yes, I grew jasmine from a very, very tall, uh, very, very small plant when I ordered my banana plant. I planted it in here and it grew and it grew and it grew and I kept pruning it because I wanted to make sure it wasn't some tall, lanky plant. And it was. It was a tall, lanky plant and it was falling over and I didn't like that. So I pruned it back like the pepper plants that I do. And uh, it did well. I put out side branches and I pruned it again. And I made sure, because these branches will grow long and if you're growing jasmine, you know what I mean. They got the big leaves, they're growing long and they start to fall over. You gotta give this plenty of light and a large pot to grow well. And uh, what I did was I made sure that I gave it plenty of calcium and uh, it had good rich soil with nitrogen and everything. That was fine. I made sure that the calcium was good in this. And I have a uh, bone meal that I use. You can use any source of calcium you want. And uh, calcium is going to help it with the flowering and stuff like that. I didn't get it to produce seeds because I just can't seem to do that. I pollinated the darn things. And by the way, this is night blooming jasmine. It's a beautiful smell. You know what jasmine smells like if you're growing it. But um, what you do is you make sure it has plenty of light and 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Give it the brightest light you possibly can good quality, rich, well-drained soil. I know this sounds like a broken record, but then again, this is a standard for growing anything well. Lots of calcium, and when your plant gets really lanky like this, prune back your stems about halfway to the main stem that they're coming off of, and eventually, you're probably gonna get flowers on it. And they flower profusely for a while, and this one stopped flowering after a while, hasn't flowered since. It's been over six months and uh, it hasn't flowered yet, but plants will flower when they're ready to flower. And forcing them really, I don't believe, is healthy for your plant. Because for a plant to put out flower and fruit, it is uh, its way of taking the excess energy that it's building up. It's like a battery, you know? It's building up this excess energy and then eventually it puts it out in a very, very exhausting manner in the way of flowers and fruit. It takes a lot of energy, you know? It's like a woman giving birth. I mean, it takes a lot out of her, you know? And it, it's very stressful. That's what it does for the plant. So your plant may not have enough reserves to put out the flower. So you don't really want to force it. Just keep supporting it, growing it well, and eventually it is going to do that. It will put out flowers eventually. This one I'm very proud of, and it's about time to prune it back again. But um, when it does flower, I guess I'll bring it on camera. They're very, very small, unremarkable flowers. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, last of the, the Voodoo Garden. I wanted to show you some plants. Um, this one was my uh, avocado plant. This one is the Detour that's gonna flower. I really didn't bring this on to show you. It's just a prop so you don't have to look at stairs. This is my jasmine that grows in the downstairs grow room. And right down here, we have the Jalokia. Remember the Jalokia pepper was the one that I did the video on and prune pep pepper plants for huge yields? Well, I've been pruning this thing back and back and back and back because I want to keep it small for the move. You know, I'm moving. And I didn't need that big, huge plant going like this. And when you move a plant, it does go through some stress. The more plant you have, the more stress it's going to go through. So I'm keeping it small so that it goes through a minimum amount of stress. But once I get it in the new house, I'll, uh, it's just go for it, you know? Uh, uh, this thing is going to go absolutely nuts, and I'm going to show you, well, i got a white fly. Yeah, this thing has white flies, but it um, doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother the plant. Anyway, let me drag out the banana plant and uh, show you some. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> this is it. This <laughs> it looked a lot smaller in the grow room. What do you think, folks? Wow. This is my Zebrina banana tree, and it's also known as a blood banana. Take a look. We're going to spin you around here. That's something, isn't it? Whoa! Don't beat up the jasmine. Come on, don't be a camera hog. This, <laughs> this is my banana tree, and it is a beauty. It is big, it is huge, I can't get it to stop. It's putting out new leaves all the time. 
and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and I can't get it to stop. So um, moving this is going to be an adventure. I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's going to the new house and I'm going to wrap it up and bring the leaves up and wrap it up in plastic and be as gentle as I can because this has gotten to be something that I love so much. I could never see myself not growing banana trees again. I'm sold. Yeah, I'm sold on banana trees. And this one, like I said, started out this big with a couple little broken leaves and this is what happens. Yeah, I, it's, I think it's like a year old. Yeah, it's not very old at all. This is what happens when you grow a banana tree. <laughs> they take over your life. Anyway, every, uh, people, thank you so much for joining me for this uh, weekend edition and uh, allowing me to show off my plant. I know it's, it's showing off, but I'm so happy to show it to you. And I hope that you're having great luck with your plants in your grow rooms. And if not, please post a question in my comment section. I'll answer. Can you see me? I'll answer the very best that I can every single time. And uh, I'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. This is Ray at the Voodoo Garden. <laughs> we are out of here. Oh God, I gotta push this thing back. Uh, can't you just take yourself back in there? Oh, good morning. Yeah, you got my ear. No. Crap. This is not easy. You know, I can't even lift this thing anymore. It's time for you to leave the house. Get a job.